So good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for coming to the ISCS student seminar. Today we have uh, Joseph Elaham. He is a student, a PhD candidate in electrical and computer engineering, and uh, he is a member of the Cosine Laboratory. And he has research interests that are focused on machine learning, Bayesian statistics, Monte Carlo methods, deep learning, reinforcement learning, stochastic optimization, and everything <laughs> under the umbrella of inference in complex systems, which have which have a, a, a variety and a broader impact in a lot of applications in different uh, fields. Uh, today he's going to uh, present the talk entitled Regime uh, Switching State Space Models. So the floor is all yours, Joseph. Thank you for that introduction, Monica. Uh, again, my name is Youssef. I am a PhD student in electrical engineering. Uh, I've been working in the IACS for three years now, started with uh, taking a class with Heather, who is one of the attendees of this talk now, um, and moving on to doing a lot of cool work with her that's very interdisciplinary, but allows me to work on some of the theory that I've developed with Monica over the years and apply it to a cool problem. And so as Monica said, this the title of this talk is Regime Switching State Space Models. Uh, it is a joint work with uh, my colleague, Liu Yang, uh, Heather, um, the chair of the electrical engineering department, uh, Peter Jurich, and of course, Monica Bugaya, my advisor. Um, so I'm gonna start off by giving you an overview of the talk. So uh, first, uh, what we'll do is we'll talk about state space models, which are a type of important models that have a wide variety of applications to a bunch of different fields. And in, in particular, we'll focus on ecology in this presentation. Uh, and then we're gonna talk about a new class of models that we've introduced that are are more flexible but easy, and still easy to interpret as standard state space models called regime switching state space models. Um, we're gonna talk about an algorithm for uh, Bayesian learning of all of the unknowns of these kinds of models. And in particular, uh, a, a cool algorithm called Gibbs sampling. Finally, we'll show some experiment results on some synthetic data uh, from a paper that we published recently to the uh, International Conference of Signal Proce Speech and Acoustics and Signal Processing, uh, which is ICASP. And then uh, I'll provide some concluding remarks about where this work is headed and what we've actually been doing now with some of the real data. Um, okay, so I'm gonna start off by motivating the work. And so I always start off with the slide because I think it's the easiest way to describe why uh, modeling is really important for a variety of applications. So we have, uh, uh, Antarctica here, or a piece of it, and the orange dots indicate different uh, Antarctic co uh, colonies where they are, where there are penguins, right? And in particular, at each particular site, uh, ecologists go out and they collect data where there are nest counts or breeding penguins and chick counts. Um, and so this is an example here of a site called Cape Crozier, where they collect the number of nest counts uh, from the year 1985 to, I think, 2013. Uh, and it's basically just a time series. And what we want to do with this time series is we want to fit an easy to interpret parametric model and understand basically the population dynamics of the Antarctic penguins and how they're changing. In other words, we want to learn how many penguins there are at each of the sites and understand their demographic parameters. So the survival rate of the penguins, their breeding rate, what the reproductive success is, all of that stuff. And the key thing that we want to point out here is that the model that we are using should be really easy to interpret because we want to communicate these findings to policymakers, for instance. And it's easier to have a nice, uh, 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 easier to interpret parametric model than to use something like a, for example, a neural network where you can't really say, neural the neural network won't tell you that the survival probability of a penguin from year one to year two, uh, 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 age one to age two is 0.9, for example. Another example, which is slightly more vain and less uh, wholesome is price prediction. So uh, for people who work maybe at a bank. Uh, so here is an example of the S&P 500 index uh, and the, uh, the associated uh, uh, price of the index from the, the May 2018 to May 2019. And in this type of application, rather than uh, understanding with an easy to interpret model, um, how the dynamics of the of the of the prices. What we want to really do is predict into the future what the price is going to be, 
Um, so those are two different applications uh, where you can actually use some of the work that we've been doing uh, and apply that directly. Uh, so to kick off, what we're going to talk about are state space models. So a state space model is a type of model uh, that models the relationship between time varying hidden states or processes and observations and, or data. And so the easiest way to understand that is to look at what it means graphically. So in this picture that we have here, we have two different uh, types of variables, the x's, which are the states, and the y's, which are the observations or the data. Um, there are two properties that are key to understanding what the state space model is doing. The first is that um, the x of t's only depend on the previous x of t. So x of 2, for example, is independent of all other variables if you know x of 1. This is called the Markov property. Uh, and the second uh, property of the state space model is that each y of t only depends on its corresponding x of t. So y1, for example, is independent of all other variables if you know x1. So basically, the, if you were trying to understand how a process that the state space model moves forward, basically x1 comes from the previous, uh, comes from x0, and then we can obtain the first data point from the x1. Um, in terms of equations, there are two equations that uh, govern the state space model. There's the state transition equation, which describes how xt evolves from xt minus one. Uh, and so, uh, and it has these parameters that I've denoted here as alpha, which basically just characterize that distribution. And then the second equation is the observation equation. And it tells us how we get the data from the particular hidden state value. So it's important to know that the only thing that we know here is the data, the whys. Everything else we need to be able to estimate to understand what the model is saying. Uh, so the unknowns here are the model parameters, which are the parameters of that state transition distribution and the observation distribution, and also all of those hidden states. That was a lot of information. So that easy, it might be easier if I give a concrete example with two applications to show you what a state space model, uh, how it would correspond to particular things we want to learn in a particular application. So let's start off with a population uh, model. So something related to that first thing I mentioned about uh, population dynamics for Antarctic penguins. So um, to start off, I'm going, to, I'm showing right here is, a, is what's called a life cycle diagram. And it describes how um, basically the species life cycle evolves. So the stage, uh, so S stands for the uh, adult or breeding uh, adult penguins, where the subscript one, two, three, four indicates the age of the penguin, whereas C represents the chicks. So for example, what this life cycle diagram is saying is that stage two penguins come from stage one penguins with probability uh, psi. So that psi would correspond to the survival rate of stage uh, of, of the adult penguins. Stage uh, the chick uh, age the stage one uh, chicks come from stage three penguins with probability phi, and what that basically is saying is that the reproductive success rate of stage three penguins is is phi, um, and we can actually convert this really simple uh, diagram and, and put it into a bunch of equations um, that basically describe that relationship using probability distributions, uh, and so. Just to give one example, the stage two penguins are, dr are drawn from a binomial distribution of stage one penguins from the previous time instant with survival probability psi. So the hidden states or the latent states, as I mentioned from the previous slides in this case, correspond to all of the uh, true abundances of each of the age classes. So the stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four uh, uh, penguins. And then the observations are the actual collected data that the ecologists go out and collect, which would be the nest counts and the, uh, the chick counts. And one important thing to note is that we don't really observe uh, each age class. We observe this total sum across age classes. Um, and so the unknown parameters of this model are the survival rate, psi, the reproductive success, phi, and then the noises in the observations. 
And so here is an example of a time series you can simulate by just running this particular model. Um, so this is an example. One thing that is a problem with this particular model is if you take a look at it and compare it to the time series I showed you earlier, it's very simple compared to it. So the simulated data from that particular model doesn't really capture the high fluctuations in the true data that we see. Uh, and in particular, if you take a look at two different segments of the real data, you'll see that the actual underlying process for each of those segments is different. And so what we want is a more expressive state space model that can accommodate, uh, that can still be easily interpreted. So it can accommodate for those high fluctuations without keep it using a super simple model, but it also is still easy, easily interpreted. The nice thing about the model in the previous slide is that it's really easy to interpret. If I estimate SAT, I'm estimating directly four parameters which have direct meaning in the real world. Another example is uh, a stochastic volatility model. So this is going back to the finance uh, uh, example. So the volatility of an asset, which is basically how, how much it fluctuates, is modeled as a latent state, whereas the log return, or the thing related to the price of the asset, is the observed process. So the model here is just a linear model uh, for the volatility, the x, and the y represents the actual log return or uh, or quote unquote price of the asset. And so the unknowns of this model would be the coefficients of that uh, transition distribution, the alpha zero, alpha one, and the noise. And then we also want to learn the latent volatility process. And so here's an example of uh, simulated data from this process. The red curve represents the volatility of the asset, whereas the green curve represents the price, uh, uh, the log return. So. The problem with this model is, is similar to the previous one, is that if you take a look at the volatility from the simulated data and compare it to the volatility, for example, of the GME stock index log return, you'll see that it, they're very different processes. Uh, in the real GME data, it's much more complex what's going on uh, and then, uh, than what is in the simulated data. So again, we arrive at the same problem for this completely different application, which is that we need something that's much more expressive than that standard state-based model that can also still be easily interpreted. This brings us to what our main contribution of the paper, which is uh, the quote-unquote regime switching state-based model. And so to order to easily explain it, I'm going to build off the previous model we had. So remember, recall that we had the states X and the data Y, so what we do is we augment the state space model with a discrete valued parameter called the regime, and it's a state. So the yellow circles are donated R1 to RT are the regimes. Uh, and these are the distinguishing properties of, the, of this kind of model. The first is that X of T no longer is, uh, is conditionally independent of all other variables given its previous value and its current regime. So I'm now drawing the arrows, arrows connecting the dependence between the regime and the states. So now you can tell x1 actually depends on r1 and x0, for example. The other property is that yt, or the data, is also dependent on the regime. So we draw arrows showing the relationship between the regime and the, and the, um, and the, uh, the data. And then lastly, in general, the regimes themselves may depend on the history of the whole regime. So they're also connected. Uh, in this sort of way. And so what this sort of model allows you to do is it, it allows you to have more flexibility in those state, uh, the state transition and the observation. So you don't have to follow one particular process the whole time. It can actually switch to different processes depending on the regime. So this, that's the gra graphical representation. And then if we want to take a look at the equations, we just have to add an additional equation called the regime transition, which describes how we get from regime from one regime to the other. And then also now the straight transition depends on the regime explicitly. So you'll see that at each time instant, the processes for the state transition and the observation can change. And this allows for a much wider flexibility with what the kind of time series you can obtain. Uh, so the unknowns of this model are, th so here's the compromise is that now I've now made the model much more flexible, but we have many more unknowns. So we have, all of the parameters for all the regimes. We have the actual parameters of the regime transition distribution. We have to learn the regimes themselves, and we also have to learn the states. So you're giving much more flexibility 
and the, with the trade-off of um, not being able to, um, with, with having uh, much more difficulty estimating the parameters. I'm going to stop here for one second and just open the floor to any questions that anyone might have um, before I move on to the next part. Yeah, a quick, a quick one. Uh, how many regimes in practice are you going to be having? Literally one per uh, observed piece of data, or, or in the end, you're just going to have like two or three regimes? It'll depend on the problem, but usually it's like two or three. Okay. So, for example, uh, just to give you some sort of uh, uh, look into the future, for example, one thing you can do is just use two regimes, right? And then uh, say, oh, and this one regime corresponds to a year of bad penguin reproductive success, whereas one regime corresponds to a year of good reproductive success. So it allows you to sort of uh, fluctuate between two different processes that could be happening in nature for any sort of reason. Um, but yeah, so it doesn't have to be a large number. It can be two or three, um, but it really depends on the problem. Excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. And Yusuf, I think um, Owen Rambo has a question also. His hands up. Sure. Yes. So you gave up the Markov assumption for the regimes. Yeah. Um, I wonder whether you could comment on that. So one question is what happens if you don't? And another question is what happens if you uh, give it up for the states as well? If you give up the Markov? Uh, oh, so that's a good question. So the reason why I did not give the Markov, uh, did not use the Markov assumption for the regimes is because for certain uh, processes that we studied, we wanted to uh, use the entire, uh, so for certain applications, it actually depends what regime you're in, depending on how many times it's been visited. So for example, if um, in a financial application, for example, if the, uh, particular state has been in a uh, been a particular regime for a long time, it's unlikely to change unless some sort of extreme event happens. Like, so that in that sort of case, if you uh, you would need that uh, the regime transition process is able to use the whole trajectory of the regimes. Um, if you don't use it, uh, if you do assume the Markov assumption, then you're kind of restricted to the kind of uh, RTs that you can draw. Um, but we haven't really experimented that far with it. Uh, and in particular, for the e example I'm going to show today, we actually don't, we assume that the regimes are independent. Um, so this, I th basically, this is just so that the model can be as flexible as possible. Thanks. And then what was your second question? You had a second question? Oh, yeah, why you didn't, um, whether you could get the same effect by basically simply removing the Markov assumption from the states and not introducing regimes at all, whether you could sort of collapse the R and the X layer, basically? Uh, it is a good, that is a very good question. You can probably get much more flexibility, but the interpretation effect probably falls apart. Um, Makes sense. Yeah, that's, that, that's, that, would be, that would be the more uh, difficult. So yeah, the, the good thing about this particular process is that uh, it's still really easily interpretable. So I can superimpose a bunch of super, super simple models and control them with the regimes uh, and, and get a nice interpretation of what's going on uh, in terms of the, the way that things are defined in this model explicitly. Thanks. You're welcome. Hey. What is the um, size of gamma? Uh, gamma? Yeah, size of gamma. Oh, so it depends. So if you, um, it could be, uh, so for example, in a really simple example, gamma could represent the probability of each regime, right? Mm -hmm. And so if they have two regimes, then gamma can, is only two dimensional. Two by It'll, two, okay. Yeah. Okay, so then, great. Thank you for your question. Can I jump in for one more quick question? You sure can, yes. Um, so I just wanna say you've done a great job ex explaining um, the, um, the state models for someone who's unfamiliar with them, but can you comment on some advanced, because um, semi-empirical models are often easily interpretable. Can you comment on some of the advantages of like regime switching um, state-based models versus um, fully time reversible semi-empirical models? I am not fully familiar with uh, semi-time uh, reversible semi-empirical models. Uh, so I don't uh, think I could give a good comparison uh, to that. Uh, the focus of this particular work, so there are certain um, state space models that 
have this sort of structure already. Um, so for example, I don't know if, if you've heard of switching linear dynamical systems before, uh, but they're, they're very similar, but they're just, this, this particular process is just generalized. Um, I don't know if there is a particular advantage to the particular processes you've mentioned. Um, so I would have to look into that separately to, to, to know. Yeah, I guess I'm just, for your reference, I'm coming from a chemistry background. So just like classical molecular dynamics could be roughly interpreted as a very high performing um, semi-empirical method. So, but I guess one thing is for this, with the um, latent states, you don't necessarily have to have like a um, very hard coded, fully enclosed um, storage system to understanding all of the dynamics where here you can just sw swap the parts out a lot more easily it seems yeah um yeah <laughs> i'd have to yeah um i think you're probably right <laughs> i'm not 100 percent uh certain about those particular kinds of models here uh the state transitions follow a particular they process where Given the regime, they they they're Markovian uh, still, um, and uh, this is just the yeah you know, the way it works. Okay, thank you. Okay, sorry. I, I wish I could have been more uh, informative than for that particular question, uh, but so that we don't lose time, I'm going to move on. Um, and so, uh, just to give it again an example back to circling back to Robert's question is that take a look, taking a look at the difference between the simulated data from that ec ecological model and the, this particular um, uh, site from Cape Crozier, uh, we can just assume, for example, in this particular segment, probably the regime is one particular value, whereas in this segment, the regime is a different value. And so in that problem, we could, for example, have three different survival rates that are monotonically increasing and it would give us much more flexibility in uh, actual time, kind of time series we could simulate. OK, so now that we've talked about the model itself, we're going to talk about what it means to do inference. Uh, and so in particular, for this particular, uh, for this particular application, we're interested in doing Bayesian inference for a variety of reasons. Uh, and one in particular is that we have a small amount of data for many of the sites. Uh, another reason is that Bayesian estimation allows us to include domain expert knowledge about previous studies that have been conducted on, on these types of models. Um, and so it just makes much more sense in this particular case. Um, so I'm going to give you a workflow basically of how Bayesian inference works. So you start off with your, for example, time series data, y1 through t. And you choose a model, say, for example, a state space or a regime switching state space model. Choosing the model gives you a particular likelihood function that tells us how likely uh, the data set was generated for, um, uh, for, for the, uh, some parameters theta, which are the parameters of the model. So it describes how well, it's basically the term that tells us the model fit for the observed data. We then uh, include a prior distribution PF theta. And this prior distribution is a probability distribution that encodes that domain expert knowledge about those parameters. And then we come to the main operation of Bayesian inference, which is to do the inference. And that's where you obtain the so-called posterior distribution, which is proportional to a product of the likelihood in the prior. And this posterior distribution summarizes the belief, our, our belief about those parameters of that model given both the likelihood and the prior. Uh, and so then uh, the last step of this workflow usually is to criticize the model. In other words, uh, can I, how do I select between one model and another, uh, a Bayesian model? Um, now let's see a visual example. So for the inference part, so the green curve here would represent, for example, a prior PDF. Uh, this is what the domain uh, expert knowledge is reflected by. The red curve would would, is the observation likelihood, and it tells us what the data is telling us. And then the posterior is sort of that compromise that takes into account both the prior and the observation likelihood. Of course, the more data you have, the more influence that likelihood will have on the posterior. And so um, in the empirical evidence, the more you have, the more you have of it, the more it overwhelms that domain expert knowledge. And so, 
here's another example uh, of a posterior, of two-dimensional posterior with two parameters theta one, theta two. And that you'll see that uh, anything that you want to do with posterior involves uh, the uh, 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 calculation of integration. So typically what we want to do is collect statistics about this posterior distribution. So for example, I want to know what the mean of the posterior is. That is an integral taken with respect to that posterior distribution. Uh, and unfortunately, in most cases, this integral is impossible to solve for a given model. And so what I do in, from, in my field is we use something called Monte Carlo methods. And Monte Carlo methods basically take samples or representative points that represent the posterior and compute uh, an, ap an approximation to the integral that is just the average of those points. So in this case, we can approximate the mean of this distribution by taking these representative samples and averaging them. Um, and so that is what we uh, do for the, in, uh, for the quote unquote inference part. And the main question that we come to is how are the samples acquired? Like how am I supposed to draw samples from a distribution that uh, I don't even know how to draw samples from? And there are a variety of methods. Uh, in this particular uh, talk, I'm just going to briefly mention uh, one method which is called MCMC. So MCMC is, um, some of you in this might be familiar with it, but I'm assuming majority are not. It's a type of algorithm, a simulation method that simulates a stochastic process, uh, in this case, a Markov chain, and the limiting distribution of that stochastic process is the posterior distribution. So for example, here's a simulated Markov chain or stochastic process, uh, a stochastic process, which is uh, a Markov chain uh, uh, that is uh, uh, obtained from an MCMC method. What, what will happen is that after a certain number of iterations of that simulation method, we'll basically arrive to a converged Markov chain or stochastic process. And that converged process, all of those state, val all those values can be taken as samples from the posterior. And so in MCMC, the main uh, problem is how do we generate the Markov chain? And the typical method that people use in literature, the most popular uh, is called Gibbs sampling. It is a form of uh, uh, a general, uh, a spe special case of a Metropolis Hastings one method. But uh, in this particular paper, we use Gibbs sampling because we were able to uh, basically up to arrive at that special case. Mm. OK, so how does it work, Gibbs sampling? The way that it works for regime switching state system models is quite simple. Basically, you start off by initializing all of the unknowns. And then you iteratively sample from the conditional distribution of each of the things you want to sample from. So the conditional, uh, so I sample at each time instant, uh, at each iteration, the states and the regimes given the previous values of the transition parameters and the model parameters. I then sample the model parameters given the, the, the states and the regimes that I just sampled. And then I sample the, the regime transition parameters given the regimes that I sampled. So the idea is you're alternately sampling from the conditional distributions of each of the, of each of the um, unknowns of the model. So for this, for this presentation, I will explain how the states and the regimes are sampled. Uh, whereas the other two steps, I, I'm not going to go into them because they basically those two steps are obtained by just doing mathematical derivations. And it's not going to be really useful for me to show uh, how the, uh, an example of those mathematical derivations for this presentation. So I'm just going to explain a simulation technique that's used to sample the states and the regimes. OK, so how are the states and this regime's trajectories sampled? So the approach that we use in our paper is called particle filtering. And so the idea of particle filtering is that you start off with some initial state and simulate different possible trajectories using the model itself. In other words, um, we, uh, we, start, we have some parameter values that are fixed and then simulate the process and then figure out which of the simulated time series are the best ones, most representative of the data. The trajectories are all weighted according to their likelihood. And then at the end, we just take a single trajectory as a sample from uh, that, um, that um, as a sample from the posterior of the regimes in the states. 
in summary, if I'm giving you a black box, I enter, uh, basically I feed in parameters to the particle filter and I am able to obtain samples of the states and the regimes as, as, as an output. Uh, and let's see an illustration of how this works. So there are mm, four steps. The first step is you sample a regime for each state value. Then you sample a new state given the previous one based on the regime you just sampled. So you'll see xt depends on rt. Then you weight each of the state regime pairs by the likelihood. And then you return to step one and you repeat until you're done. And so you start off, for example, here, the gray dots represent the different candidate state values. Then you propagate forward using steps two, two to three. The color here represents the particular regime that was used to obtain the next state value, whereas uh, the size represents the weight of each of the, of the state regime pairs. So this particle, for example, uh, or state value is, has a very high weight because it has a high likelihood. If we were to do this several times, where basically we use a process called bootstrap to sample higher weighted particles uh, more than other ones, we can propagate forward until we obtain an entire sequence of regimes and states. And in the very last step, we only uh, we do a resampling to obtain just one particular pair. And so basically at the end, we adopt one sample and then take its whole ancestor, ancestral line as the state and regime trajectory. This is an example of how particle filtering is able to sample the regimes and states. OK, so then that is the algorithm for sampling the regimes and states. And so we're going to take this. Um, Gibbs sampling method and apply it to a particular problem where we want to uh, use it, uh, and it, the ecological problem that I had mentioned earlier to estimate those dem demographic parameters. So um, just to move forward, here's an example of simulated data from uh, a model for uh, e um, ecological penguins. And so we assume that the transition process is uh, follows a multi nulli distribution, which basically just means that each regime has some probability of being sampled at each time instant. Then we have a very similar model to the one that I showed earlier, where the distinction that we make is that the reproductive rate can switch from one time instant to the next. And then finally, we have the observation process, which is the same as it was earlier. And the goal of this experiment was basically just to see, understand the behavior of the regime switching state space model, how it's different from just using one of these uh, models, and what happens if you use too many regimes. And so, in particular, we do an experiment where we try with one regime, two regimes, and three regimes. And the reproductive rate, for example, in one regime, you end up getting a posterior distribution centered around 0.46. That's unimodal. If you use two regimes, you actually get two different reproductive rates, right? Because as I said before, they switch. And the first observation that we can make from just these three plots is that if you take a look at the posterior for the case where we assume just one regime, it ends up being sort of an average between the case we assume two regimes. And you'll see in, uh, when we look at the predictions why that is. And finally, what if we use three regimes? Uh, this is indicating an overparameterization, basically. So now we have three different re uh, reproductive rates. And you'll see that the one in the middle uh, is multimodal, switching between the values of the smaller one and the larger one. And so multimodality for any of the parameters can be a good heuristic for detecting the overparameterization, or basically the fact that there could be too many regimes. OK. So we can further build on these results to see what the, how, we, how well we predict the data for each of the different models. Assuming one regime, this is what a prediction would look like. So basically, as we had hypothesized, it would not be able to capture the high um, fluctuations in the data using just the one simple model. And in fact, um, what it's doing is it's overestimating the observation error in order to accommodate for the fact that there's high fluctuations in the data. So it's giving you a result that's not super accurate in terms of the prediction. And it's also telling you that um, the 
person who collected data is just really bad at collecting data. Um, if we assume two regimes, we're able to get a much better fit to the, to the data with very low observation error. And then what happens if we use the overparameterized model where we have three regimes? Well, you get a very similar result to assuming two regimes. And so the other observation is, although having three regimes is overparameterized, the predictive performance is still really good for predicting the data. It's just the interpretation of three regimes is not adding any value to if we had done with just two. OK, so that is a summary of this experiment. And I'm going to go into just concluding and telling you about some of the future work that we're currently doing. Uh, so what we did is we motivated and introduced a special kind of model called the regime switching state space model. We discussed an uh, algorithm for doing inference or Bayesian learning um, to, uh, to learn the posterior distribution of the states, regimes, and model parameters. And then we demonstrated the performance uh, on the, of the infra algorithm on the ecological application. So the future lines of research, which are some of them we're actively working on now, is handling of missing data. So none, I did not assume that there was any missing data. But in fact, you can talk to Heather about this. Most of the time series, actually, I think all of them are incomplete in, in the sense that there are huge gaps in the data, some, sometimes 10, up to 10 years. Um, and so the algorithm needs to be able to accommodate that. Um, what do we do if we want to implicitly estimate the number of regimes if they're unknown? Like, so how do we go about doing that? And then last, how do we expand the use of these models to a wider variety of applications? And so with that, I conclude my presentation and thank you for your time and opening the floor to any questions you guys might have. So thank you. Thank you <laughs> You're welcome. Maybe I can jump in with a quick question, and it's more of a clarification. So when you showed the, the two distributions that emerged, if you assumed that there were two, they look nearly identical. So how, what is it about having that extra variable that's really giving you that increased fidelity in the fitting? Uh, so you're talking about this particular Correct. slide here? Yeah. Right. And so uh, they are identical, but they're centered at different values. So for example, oh, I didn't see the range. Okay, fine. Yeah. So here, uh, this one's the, the smaller reproductive rate is, the, this is basically saying that there are two regimes, one where the reproductive rate is lower and it's 0.33, and one where the reproductive rate is higher and it's 0.52. Okay, great. Um, and so that is, it's, it's in the same case for the first one. There's a unit, it's unimodal. Um, but it's this one is giving you much more flexibility because you're allowed to switch between years of low success versus high success. Okay, okay, that, that's fine. I missed the X scale. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Yusuf, I have a question. Sure. Can you go back to where you explained the um, regime switching particle filtering, the actual graph? Here? Yes, this. So the last step, I'm just a little bit confused. Why did we just go with like one particle? It's, uh, or yeah. that maybe how, like I know there's like resampling, but. Yeah. So, I'm remembering like particle, uh, um, like where the park particles degenerate, so. Right, uh, okay. So um, maybe what I didn't explain well here is that we are doing resampling at each time instant because we're implicitly sampling more from mm -hmm. each of the, the, from the particles that have larger weights, right? And so for example, you see that this giant particle here in the third step has yes. four mm -hmm. children, four children. Um, mm -hmm. And so what we want to do with this particle filtering method, if you go back to the Gibbs sampling algorithm, is we just want one sample from it to obtain the sample of the state and the regimes. So the way we do that uh, Z is basically what we do is once we have the full particle filter run and we have all the particles with all their weights, we go to the last step and we resample just one particle based on the weights. And that particle happens to be this one. And then in order to obtain the state, the sample of the whole trajectory, we just follow its ancestors along okay. that path. And so okay. that's, the, that's the basically the idea here. Um, so uh, if you wanted to estimate for, if you wanted to know what the state estimate was, then you would know, for example, to just take an average of all the particles, right? Uh, but in this mm -hmm. case, we're, we're just trying to obtain one sample. So you 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 basically just do one resampling step and then follow the trajectory back. Mm 
Okay. So still, if I want to know the state, if I want to estimate the state, I will still just take the average of each at each. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I, you can't do that for the regimes because they're discrete, yeah. but you can, you can, for example, just count how many more, like you can estimate by just saying, okay, the regime that is, is appearing largest would be the uh, estimate of the regime, for example, the mode of the, of that uh, particular. Oh. Okay. I see. I think we had a hand up from someone in the light engineering conference room. Yeah, um, I don't know where the microphone is in this room, so let me know if I'm like very loud right now. <laughs> no, Kurt, Kurt, is, Kurt, is that you? That is me. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> no camera, have, Kurt. It's it's like pointed at the wall, so I didn't. Oh, want okay. To <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, what's your question? So you mentioned this multimodality heuristic for determining when you've uh, decided on enough regimes. How come, do you have any like qualitative explanation for why this might happen? Because one case that I'd be interested in understanding if it might occur anecdotally is why would Phi 2 not just compete with only Phi 3? Like why would it split its attention between two modes? That is a really, really good question. And the reason is because we enforced, uh, uh, what you call it, monotonicity in the parameters. So we assume phi one is smaller than phi two is smaller than phi three. So this, the reason why we did that was to make sure that the model was interpretable or uh, uh, not interpretable, sorry. The model was uh, uh, identifiable. If you don't enforce these sort of constraints, then the correlation to a structure will be crazy everywhere. So you have to, when you're doing this kind of modeling, enforce a constraint like that. Otherwise, these all of them would be multimodal, actually, in that sort of case. So that's the reason why it was switching off the way it was. And probably the reason why the peak for 0.5 is higher is probably because that particular regime was just more frequent than the other one. Awesome, thank you. You're welcome. Such good questions. I really appreciate it. Okay, so I guess with that. Uh... Sorry, one more. I think Owen Rambo has a hand up. Let's see. There we go. Sure. <laughs> yes, um, I have sort of a higher level question. Uh, if I understand correctly, uh, one of the reasons why you like these graphical models is interpretability. You've said that repeatedly, and that makes sense. Yeah. I don't understand correctly that for the uh, hidden states, you, you particularly bring an existing idea of what these states are to the model. Like, you know, you have chicks and penguins, and they have different uh, years and so on. Whereas for the regime, you don't. Or do you also have a notion? I mean, you discover what the regimes are. As of now, we have no idea what they mean. But okay. I have uh, been brainstorming about what we can possibly do with this sort of model. So for example, it could be that the probability of a particular regime depends on certain covariates. Like, I don't know, some covariates that they collect, uh, I don't know, like about the particular climate conditions in that particular year. So maybe one thing that could be done is adding an extra uh, part to the model, which is saying that this alpha follows a process that's related to, for example, the wind, the wind speed in a particular season, the average wind speed. Um, so that's the sort of idea is that right now, the regimes, they mean something, but we don't know why. We don't know why a particular year has a bad year. Um, it's just saying, in fact, it's just giving the, the data more flexibility at this point. It's not really telling us for certainty that this was a year that was bad for X reason. Um, so yeah. It's Actually, a, Yusuf, can I, if I could just jump in just to, to clarify as well that there are hundreds and hundreds of these populations around the continent. So even like it, we, you didn't have a chance to get into it, but in terms of looking at correlations in regime switching, um, if sites are correlated in their regime switching, um, even understanding the spatial scale of regime of correlated regime switching would allow us to um, identify what likely 
uh, drivers might be um, because you know certain features of the environment um, fluctuate on certain spatial scales. So if they're completely uncoupled, that would actually be really informative. Um, so that, that might be one way of using the regime switching um, to get at the uh, question I think uh, Owen was you know driving at. Also a very good question. I, I um, somebody also asked me that uh, I had given this presentation before. They were just like, well, how come you don't know? Uh, if it's a bad year based on covariate data. And I was just like, as of now, we're, we're having enough trouble estimating the parameters of this model with just this many. <laughs> you don't give me any more to estimate, <laughs> please. <laughs> so, yeah. Christian has his hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to, to ask, so the, the discrete <clears throat> states uh, or regimes that you're talking about, it, so talking about covariates like um, like wind, weather, you know, uh, other sorts of factors that could be driving these sorts of things. Uh, have you thought about um, variations, I guess, that would uh, admit more continuous change as opposed to these sort of discrete switches, either in combination or kind of parametrically moving from, you know, a, a purely discrete scenario to something softer or yeah, anything a, in that vicinity? I have not thought about that too much, but it's definitely um, a good point to think about. I, I chose this particular parameterization just because it's so simple. Like <laughs> it's from one time instant to the next, it's really um, easy to be able to just say, oh, the model just changed, like according to just one discrete step. Um, so I have not been able to think about how to include such covariate data in a more continuous uh, process. But I think, Heather, you have had some models, right, that uh, some generative model that do include covariate data, right? Yeah, actually, and, and Bill Gajansen, who's, I think, uh, on here, he uh, um, was before, um, is is a postdoc kind of leading up a lot of that, that work. And one of the uh, things that we're doing now is pulling data out of of climate models that are constrained by observation. So we're, we, we literally started with hundreds of, of states that are estimated by these climate models and we're boiling it down in this um, random forest kind of model um, to, to make that link. So we're kind of, we're, we're kind of have two, two sides, the parameter estimation side and the covariate side and hoping that they'll meet in the middle um, very yeah, right. shortly. Yeah, right now they're separate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because I can see the, the simplicity being desirable, but um, at the same time, uh, you, you know, categorical uh, variables are make sampling difficult. So, you know, th there's obvious trade offs there. So I was just curious yeah. about, especially when you yeah. start talking about it, it. I will say that the, the, um, not so much the, the, the area that um, uh, Yusef showed at the beginning of his talk is one where we have the best link between environmental variables and fluctuations in abundance. And it's still only like an R squared of, you know, 40%, right? Like 40% of the variation is explained. In other areas of Antarctica, we're literally talking like 3%. Like we, we like our understanding of environmental drivers of those fluctuations is, is almost none. And in fact, our best forecasting models right now are just random walks, like, like, a, like a Brownian motion. Like, <laughs> Our ability to link these fluctuations to the environment um, has been like, you know, the last 10 years of work and, and none of it um, is very good. So I think part of what, what's interesting here is that we can extract things like reproductive success um, in, in a way that doesn't, um, it's like right now that's completely unknown for most populations because we don't have a chance to count both nests and chicks. So it's kind of revealing some of the inner workings of these uh, of the dynamics. Whereas in the past, all we're doing is we've got one number, which is how many how many breeding pairs. Uh, also, Christian, I think I understood your question a little better now. So basically, uh, what you're saying is that uh, because I'm working in a discrete space for the regimes, the sampling could be more challenging. That is 100% correct because of the fact that um, if you have many regimes you have to uh, use a discrete distribution to sample. And the, the number of combinations is really large uh, um, if you assume uh, multiple switching between the parameters. Um, so we haven't encountered that problem simply because we've only done things like assume two regimes, 
<laughs> so, uh, or three regimes or four regimes for, and assume just one of the parameter switches. But as if you can uh, see, there are four different unknown parameters in this model. And if we allow them all to switch, then it would be the two to the uh, two to the four different possible regimes. And that just scales with the number of parameters in the model. So we just kept, kept it simple for, for now. And that's why we haven't really encountered a problem with the sampling. Makes sense. Thanks. You're welcome. Sorry, I didn't find the hand raise thing, but I just wanted to say, because when you had mentioned that the regimes added flexibility, I, I think you can go a little bit farther and say that they do have physical, like the two regimes do really have physical meaning. It would, um, as Heather had mentioned, it's very difficult to assign what the cause of the two regimes are, but from the success of your model, especially with the two regimes, I would almost say that it's like a joint probability is really what you have is a joint probability of given a low birth year or a high birth year plus the previous the previous the previous counts is better so it's not necessarily just like a true one step markov but like a a joint a joint probability Mark, markov chain that is the success right. of this 100% yeah Yeah, thank you. And also, especially with all the discrete parts, I think that the discrete parts, ease of interpretation and the ease of adding constraints makes the state space switching models a lot easier than semi-empirical, a lot of which has to do with <laughs> continuous variables and outputs. I would be interested, though, if you were to, if you were to send a, a paper or some sort of, I mean, I'll look it up myself after um, about those kinds of models, uh, just to see what the difference is myself. Uh, that would be also very, very uh, nice. Yeah, uh, I don't know if there's a good one to point to, just because a lot of a lot of the I'm probably using overly complex terminology, but semi-empirical really is just like functional fitted, um, functional fitted data. So um, I guess like a linear least square is is like the most simplistic version of a se of a semi-empirical model. Oh, okay. So you have a Continuous variable, continuous function with some number of param some number of parameters to it, and then I think that's kind of where you can get a bit more flexibility with time reversibility because you have the complete system versus just like the previous steps information. Right. So. Right. Uh, and we have. Oh, okay. I see. Uh, yeah, thanks again. Awesome. Oh, thank. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. One last question. You you referred to a paper in the beginning. Was the I I put one in the chat. Is that it, or did you actually? Because you mentioned something about like I don't know if you have published anything in uh, regards to switching for the penguins. Which slide was it at? Uh, oh oh, I think I had already sent you the paper. Oh okay okay. I just yeah, wanted yeah, yeah. to. I know it's the one that we sent to ICASP uh, for this may so it's not out out yet it's but i have a copy if anyone wants it <laughs> oh, uh, okay. it'll it'll be um look it did it did it did its thing again uh it'll be out um uh i probably in may or june something like that okay okay thank so, you so much. a great presentation thank uh, you so thank you all for attending i really appreciate it Thank you. Great job, Yusuf. Thank you. <laughs>